Right, so good morning and welcome to our very early morning session. Um, to say the least, yes. Having a session at this time is a bit of a challenge. And, and for those who want to hear the challenge, we'll, we can have a discussion after, uh, offline as to why it's at this time and, and, and so on. But here we are. Um, my name is Tracy Hackshaw. I'm the Vice Chair of the Internet Society Trinidad and Tobago Chapter. Um, can you, someone can't hear? You can hear? Okay, good. All right. So in the room, I imagine we have several people from our small island developing states, as well as some large island states. Yes, I think I'm seeing a few people from Australia, New Zealand, and so on. So welcome to the workshop. Um, I will introduce to my immediate right um, Maureen Hilliard. She is the president, board chair of the Pacific Islands chapter of the Internet Society. Um, on my immediate left, we have uh, Mr. Patrick Hussain, who is from Trinidad and Tobago, and he is the .tt administrator, actually. The Nick, to my immediate, well, to my second left, I have TR. Um, I can't sorry, pronounce your, your surname, but TR is, is, is what we're calling him. And he is from Micronesia. He's from Chuk. He's from Chuk. That's a very small island. That's fantastic. And um, on remote moderating today, we have Ms. Sintra Sukhanan. She is from the ISOC Trinidad and chapter. She's actually the chair of the chapter. So welcome to Sintra Remote Moderating. And welcome to all of you who have come together today. We expect a few more to turn up, I'm sure. And um, what I'm going to do is simply start briefly by giving a background to the session as to why we're doing this particular topic. and. I'm going to then move on to a round table discussion. So the idea is, this is not a panel in a traditional sense. I'm expecting and hoping that all of you will participate fully in the discussion. There are mics at everybody's tables, a lot of room on a table. So I expect that all of you would, would jump in as equal participants in this discussion. And it's a round table, not a us and you um, session. So basically, last year, uh, a few of us, uh, Maureen and myself and, and other interested parties decided that the small island developing states were not being viewed or, or given much uh, recognition in the internet governance world. And we decided that perhaps it's time to have some sort of agenda or, or, work, or, or research agenda at the very least to move forward with um, that discussion. The reason being in my part of the world, from Trinidad and Tobago, we are a group with Latin America. In the Pacific part of the world, they're often a group with Asia, Asia Pacific. In the African Indian Ocean type, they generally group with Africa in some cases, and in the um, Asia Pacific in other cases. But there are many commonalities among the islands themselves that are not necessarily based on your geographic location. In many cases, the Mobile operators, strangely enough, are the same, which is kind of odd. Um, in many cases, the, the actual role of, of infrastructure is very similar, meaning the way it's been rolled out and how it's being rolled out, and the delays and the challenges that are included. And in many cases, the access infrastructure and the access challenges are very, very similar. Um, in some islands, they are much worse, and other islands, they are better, but not as, not as great as, let's say, a, a larger country, or even a landlocked country. And as well, there are some pretty unique challenges that small island states face, primarily related to disaster um, management issues, and issues of business continuity when something happens. So we're quite prone to issues related to, uh, to environmental challenges. Um, I don't want to say tsunami necessarily, but we're quite prone to things of that nature. And when something like a, an earthquake um, um, hits any small island type region, it's devastating to almost the entire country. So it's not a part of the country, it's in the entire country. And we could use Haiti as an example of what could happen with an earthquake in a particular country. And I'm sure there are many other examples that we could talk about. So there should be a, a, a separate 
special, unique focus on small island states. And so we thought there should be a, a look at that. And what we did last year, we had a workshop which attempted to address the overall issues and come up with a research agenda. And we had some presentations from colleagues, uh, Maureen was there as well, some colleagues from the Caribbean, and we had from Mauritius, I believe, talking about the various issues and challenges. And in the report that came out of it, the broadband issue and the broadband access dilemma, as I call it, became one of those major issues we wanted to focus on. So as we roll out this agenda for the SIDS um, internet governance issue, we thought we'll start with the broadband access dilemma and uh, um, call together a few people who have experiences and some expertise in the area. And um, what I'll quickly do now, and I'll stop talking, is talk to Maureen who has a lovely slide presentation, and she will give some sort of setting the stage for it. Next, we will have Patrick from .tt, who will respond from the Caribbean perspective, and also give some ideas as to what is happening in the region and in Trans Tobago. And thereafter, TR would look at a particular case study in Micronesia, and in Chuk in particular, that sought to address the issue uh, of, of access um, but there are significant challenges built in that he will try and speak to those challenges. And thereafter, it's opened up the floor to everyone. So it is not something that we are going to be panelisting about. Feel, feel free to come in and share this discussion with us. All right, enough from me. Maureen, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you all very, very much for for turning up this morning, it's this hour of the morning anyway. Um, I want to go through this really, really quickly because I don't want to take up too much time. This is just to, first of all, um, to give you an overview of um, the Pacific with a specific um, case study of the Cook Islands and the limitations that, um, you know, like uh, exist within a small island state um, and looking at um, basically the costs and the affordability, um, which is a major um, barrier to um, access in the Pacific. Um, looking at the Pacific region, we've got three main ethnic, ethnic groups and it's a very wide area from the um, Papua New Guinea um, on one side to Easter Island on, on the other. But if we look at it from the perspective of um, cable, um, cable connections as they stand at the moment in and around the Pacific, you will see that red dot, that's us. Cook Islands, in the middle of nowhere, um, no connection to anything. But we're surrounded by islands and countries that actually already have access. Our dilemma is, what do we do? Okay, are we going to connect up to with, with the cable or we look at the alternative option, which is what we are currently doing at the moment, which I will discuss. So there we are. Um, uh, Vanuatu, Fiji and Tonga I have actually highlighted there because they actually are um, countries that um, I actually did some um, surveying on, on costs um, in relation to what it costs Cook Islands currently for access. Okay, if you're looking at the Cook Islands, for example, at the whole population, 13,000. Okay, so already we're looking at an issue, you know, like can we afford to bring in, um, you know, can we afford cable? It's, you know, for a population of 13,000, that's over 13 um, um, inhabited islands. Um, nine of them are actually on, <coughs> on the main island of, <coughs> sorry, um, are on the main island of Rarotonga. We have a monopoly um, service provided by Telecom Cook Islands. Um, you know, when you've got 9,000 people on an island, uh, it's like difficult to actually sort of like be looking at um, too many suppliers. Um, but um, according to Telecom, we have 2,700 uh, broadband connections. Some of those connections are perhaps in, uh, like for example, in a ministry. So there might be lots of people connected to that. Um, to that. So it's sort of like a little bit difficult to sort of like look at how many people are actually using those 2,700 connections. But there are 11,000 mobile connections in a population of 13,000. And half of those mobiles are already connected to the internet. They're in packages that actually have access to the internet. So already you're looking at um, mobiles as being, you know, like the, the most um, 
uh, desirable, sort of like access. Um, Legislation-wise, we've got two acts. You know, we've had internet connection for a long time, we've got two acts. The Telecommunication Act has been in place for a long time um, and it needs serious review and it has been reviewed but the monopoly situation um, is such that um, Cook Islands has actually went bankrupt in about the late 1900s or close to bank bankruptcy and they actually sold their shareholding to Telecom New Zealand and to, they, Telecom New Zealand tied up the Telecommunications Act so badly that if we introduce um, competition um, it's going to cost us majorly. So the government and Telecom, are, and New, Telecom New Zealand who owns 60% of Telecom Cook Islands are still working on um, that act. We have a spam act which came in in 2004. Why spam? Um, I don't know but um, obviously someone came in with one that was handy. We've never enacted it. The ICT unit um, is based with the office of the Prime Minister. Um, gets no funding um, and it is really just, it has nothing to do, you know, like I mean, it doesn't produce any policy. It is basically a um, maintenance section for the ministries. E-government was introduced at one stage, uh, was, was really, um, was rejected by a lot of the ministries because government ministries are the key um, employers of quite a few of the population. Very, they were very reluctant to introduce anything that might take away their jobs. That's how they viewed technology. And so that from the um, secretaries, the heads of um, ministries down, there was real reluctance to introduce it effectively. Um, and also this lack of awareness at government level meant that there wasn't any support at that time. At, you know, and yet they'd accepted um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of UNDP money to introduce it and it went nowhere. Um, we have an NGO. Um, of which I am the president, uh, the Cook Islands Internet Action Group, um, which basically lobbies and is a thorn in the side of government um, trying to um, implement um, some changes to the internet development in the Cook Islands. And of course, the option that we, that telecom is offering for Cook Islands is O3B. And that's the new satellite, satellite connection. So this is seen to be our alternative. This is yeah, seen to be the alternative that telecom is offering um, in, in, instead of cable, which you know hasn't actually been looked at properly enough to see whether it's going to be cost effective for, for us as an island. Um, I sort of like did a, um, got some support from my Pick ISOC members and looked at an overview of how much it co what, um, standard broadband costs were. And um, Cook Island sort of like, you know, sort of featured in, in the middle of things. Fiji has got a really good market um, sort of like system going, so their costs are pretty low. Um, this is just looking at costs for 1, 5, 10, 15, and 20 gigs uh, broadband. Papua New Guinea, major expense. Because it's really, really expensive there. When, um, when looking at um, low level broadband for example, Cook Islands always features well because we actually have, uh, although with our small population, we actually have an average monthly wage that is a lot higher than that offered in, um, in other countries in the Pacific and um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a little bit skewed. Um, especially when you're looking at it from the perspective of Tonga which has an average um, monthly wage of $350 US and Papua New Guinea has an average of you know, um, $225. This is monthly, monthly um, income. Um, and also when you're looking at population, we've got 13,000, there's 100,000 in Tonga and there's 7.2 million in, in Papua New Guinea. So it's, you know, um, when you look at the costs in Papua New Guinea, like uh, and the average wage, there's a major um, divide. Um, and even when it comes to higher level, Papua New Guinea's way up to $759 um, for a month of, um, you know, for six gig. 
Um, so then we look at mobiles, okay, if we're looking at 100 meg um, sort of like level, low level use, and this is from Network Strategies, which is an, um, an, an independent um, research company. Um, again, looking at what Cook Islands actually sort of like has to offer with um, 11,000 mobiles and how, over half of them connected to the internet. Um, low, um, low level, again, like the, the costs are actually a lot more affordable for mobile. So you're actually, you know, like I mean, it seems to be not only, um, you know, like you can understand why more people are going for um, mobile um, access. So when it comes to to um, looking at what sort of like options there might be available for the Cook Islands, um, the O3B um, is something that we still have to trial. It's, it's actually um, going to be in operation next month. Um, we will look at, um, I mean, they haven't sort of like come to us about how much it's going to cost. Um, so all those sorts of, uh, they're still um, unknowns at the moment. So, but we, having just had a Pakai net in, in Tonga, where they've just recently connected up with cable, Tonga and the Cook Islands will definitely be looking at comparisons and, and seeing what sort of like, um, you know, how affordable it is for both of those countries and looking at it from a future viewpoint. Thank you. Wow, okay. That's huge. That was extremely informative, Maureen. Thank you. So, um, Patrick, I'm wondering if um, you could give a a sense as to what's happening in the region, the Caribbean region, and maybe take the discussion to an, an, an area where, in terms of technology, what's happening as well. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm, I'm based at the university, so I am not uh, very familiar with what the government is doing inside. I can tell you what I know from the outside uh, with respect to Trinidad and Tobago government and, and the, uh, other governments within the Caribbean. Um, you know, I would say all, all the uh, islands in the Caribbean have um, broadband um, access strategies in, um, being worked on. Um, these are mostly based on, on wired technologies, you know, running fiber optic cables, uh, etc. Uh, my interest in particular is more on, on uh, low cost wireless um, uh, solutions. And I, I, I'll explain why. Uh, but coming back to the uh, broadband strategy uh, in, in Trinidad in, in particular, there, there, there are plans to introduce uh, high-speed, uh, low-cost uh, uh, access for, for the rural communities uh, used in wired networks. Unfortunately, I have, I have no uh, nice statistics like Maureen to present. Um, uh, I, but what I will talk about is uh, some of the things we have been looking at at the university in terms of providing uh, low cost access to, to rural communities. Um, so let me start off. Uh, first of all, for very high speeds, yes, you need wired uh, connectivity. Uh, the problem with, with uh, uh, implementing or deploying a wired network uh, is, is the time and cost. Um, for, for small islands, um, uh, my personal opinion is uh, a, a wireless strategy is probably um, more efficient. You can get it off the ground very quick, quickly, especially because of um, the topology of most of these islands. Um, and the fact that uh, the, you know, for especially for cellular networking, uh, density, user density is not a major issue. Um, again, the terrain is, is uh, sufficiently flat to, to, to use uh, large cell sites as opposed to more condensed cell sites in, in the developed world. Uh, so <clears throat> let me talk about some, some different wireless uh, options. The, the first one, of course, would be based on cellular technology, which is uh, very mature. Um, and let me, let me talk about the, you know, what, what's happening in terms of future networks. Uh, right now, the present uh, cellular technology being used for, for, for data is, is LTE, uh, as well as HSPA, uh, also called 4G, but it's not really 4G. Um, nice thing about LTE is it's pure uh, database, packet switched, uh, and the plan is to eventually uh, use voice over LTE as well. Right now, LTE does not support voice very well because it's um, because of the 
particular technology. So uh, most operators in the US, for instance, use the LTE 4G for, for data, and they would um, use their uh, older technologies like uh, WCDMA 3G, uh, HSP, etc., for, for the voice aspects. In our particular case in the Caribbean or in, in the small islands in general, I see LTE being as a good initial uh, step towards providing low-cost uh, broadband access to the rural community because what we could do is, is for instance, if the government uh, sponsors an LTE network, which is used purely for data, the devices support both LTE and uh, uh, 3G networks. So, so for instance, if you're in, uh, in the US uh, and uh, uh, you have AT&T as an operator, your, your data will be uh, run over the LTE network and your voice over the present um, uh, CDMA or WCDMA network. Something similar could be done in, in, in the islands where the government runs the, the data uh, LTE network and the, um, the uh, incumbent operators run the, the, um, the voice aspect, the, the GSM or CDMA um, cellular network. So it would be technically feasible because the same device would be able to support both. There's no need for the, the uh, consumer to, to connect to one network for voice and one for data. Um, so again, it is a technical uh, possibility, um, but it requires a significant coordination. Uh, with the advent of uh, LTE Advanced, it would provide even higher speeds than, than what we have now. So in, 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 you know, we, we'll start getting up to close to gigabit per second rates. Um, so that, that would be one solution where the, the, the government subsidizes the data ac access uh, over wireless. The next level in terms of uh, speed uh, would be, for instance, something based on, um, on a Wi-Fi type um, hotspot uh, network throughout the country. Uh, and some countries, and I believe TR will be talking about uh, one, one uh, example of, of using that uh, type of approach. Um, one of the difficulties in that is, you know, the coordination and who sponsors which spot hotspots, et cetera, throughout the country. Uh, I believe Barbados uh, initiated such a, such a project um, and uh, has uh, experienced some success, uh, uh, data access to, to rural communities. Uh, assuming rural communities already have power, um, you could actually use the power grid. Um, so we are actually working on a, a smart grid project and we will look at, 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 uh, at some of those aspects of how you would use the power grid to provide um, uh, high speed or relatively high speed data access. Uh, finally, uh, at the lowest cost end is using something called packet radio, amateur packet radio. And we have been looking at this not so much for providing rural uh, uh, data access for rural communities, but more for disaster recovery. Uh, you know, in the, in the Caribbean, for instance, with earthquakes, sorry, not earthquakes, hurricanes, um, it is um, bring the uh, entire uh, cellular infrastructure down. And when that happens, you need some way to quickly um, provide some sort of uh, internet access or data access within the uh, country. Uh, packet radio would give you that ability. The speeds are relatively small but it's something we are looking at where um, uh, amateur packet radio operators would quickly uh, set up a, 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 a packet radio network and you would interconnect to this packet radio network with Wi-Fi devices. So for instance, you would be able to use your phone to interconnect with the packet radio network, which in turn would be interconnected with the outside world uh, via regular fiber optic cables if they are, uh, uh, are still oper operable or via uh, satellite as well. Um, so those are, are the possibilities and, and, and so we are really looking more at, at solutions as opposed to plans um, and these are some of the things we are looking at at, at the university. Okay. Thank you very much Patrick. Um, but right now I'd like to, so this is a round table, I mean, <coughs> sorry, check to see. If there's any remote um, interventions coming in, Sintra, anything as yet? Uh, I'm very sorry to report that we're having a lot of technical difficulties on this side. 
um, in terms of the audio, it's very difficult for um, for them to hear. So uh, there are no specific comments on at this point, but due to the technical difficulties, it, it may be difficult as well to have our remote panelists come in. All right. So maybe what we could do is, if there are any interventions via text, you could ask, um, get them to read it out, perhaps. Um, so we'll come back to you shortly. Um, just before I move to TR, are there any interventions from the from the round table that um, to respond to either Maureen or to um, Patrick at this point? I'm seeing two hands, three. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Don Hollander from the Pacific Internet Partners, and uh, just a quick question, Maureen, to get a, a sense of scale from. You said there were 2,700 broadband connections in the Cooks for 13,000 people. How many dwellings? How many either houses or buildings? I don't know. Um, the, for the 2,700 um, broadband connections, I mean, that included like ministries, businesses, a, as well as um, domestic. You know, they were just 2,700 connections. And that was just the information I got from from Jules, at C, who's the CEO. CEO. Okay, because I'm, if you if you got say 500 or five people to a family, then that sounds like pretty um, uh, intensive penetration. So, and then Patrick, um, could you explain what you meant by government sponsor? As a, and how is that different than? than a private sector investment? I, um, which, which I, I talk about using LTE, for instance, for, for data, to provide data access. I'm not so worried about the, the technology. I'm just worried about the, the structure. Uh, and what I think I heard, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, what I think I heard was that in uh, Trinidad and Tobacco, the uh, government is quite happy to subsidize uh, people's telecommunications or or internet use is that, or is that something that people want to happen, or does it happen? So it's that you use that term government sponsor you use it a couple of times, and I just wasn't quite sure what that meant. Okay, as I said, there, there is a broadband strategy, um, <clears throat> and I am not quite sure exactly how uh, how much it will be sub subsidized by the government. Um, I have no info on, on that. But I believe there will be some some sort of subsidy for that um, access. So subsidization of, of core monopoly or core services is not uncommon there. Excuse me. So it wouldn't be uncommon to have the government subsidized electricity or telephone or water or. No, no, it's, it it is is common. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, good morning. My name is Nicolas Caballero, uh, Internet Society Ambassador from Paraguay. I have a couple of questions, uh, actually two questions. Uh, one is related to Universal Services Fund. If, uh, my question is if there's, there's such a thing in your countries and how it is applied. Uh, Universal Services Fund, right? And the second question is about local loop and bundling, if there's any legislation uh, regarding that. Thank you. Before I take that question to the well, not to the panel, not to, to, to somebody else, um, I saw a question from left of the room, or right on your side. Uh, good morning, Mike Jensen from South Africa. Uh, I've worked on a number of small island fiber interconnectivity projects in the Indian Ocean and in the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, I was wondering whether the Cook Island had looked at some sort of regional cooperative effort. In particular, it looks like, by my reading of your map, that uh, Tonga, Samoa, and French Polynesia all just have a single fiber connection. And uh, in this day and age, you really can't just depend on one fiber connection. You really need a redundant loop. And it looks like the Cook Islands is in a very strategic place to interconnect the three countries um, together. So you could get your own connection by trying to do some sort of regional cooperation with the uh, 
this other island, perhaps. I wondered if you'd looked at that. Um, for the Caribbean situation, I was a bit surprised I didn't hear anything about looking at using TV white space technologies, uh, considering that these operate at a lower frequency than um, the traditional Wi-Fi technologies, for example, and so can span much longer distances, up to 70 kilometers, and, and they not don't require line of sight. So in a tropical situation where you have a lot of trees, there's a lot of potential for using this kind of technology for, uh, for providing uh, local loop connectivity. Thank you. Um, just just responding to the um, to the um, comment about the linking the, with the other three countries that are around us, um, I know for a fact there's been very little investigation by the government, and this is one of the things that I'm actually want, wanting to push is that um, th that there is actually more consultation and more um, like more information being shared with government uh, and governments in the Pacific actually about what the possibilities and potentials are for for this um, enhanced networking between the different countries. But, yeah, with respect to your uh, comment about white space, <coughs> uh, again I'm not privy as to what the government is doing right now, but I, I know they are looking at, at that uh, at uh, that uh, that aspect, uh, dynamic uh, spectrum allocation (DSA), um, and we we are pushing for that because it's a more efficient use of the spectrum. Um, uh, so I believe they 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 are planning to do something, but I'm not previous to specifically what. All right. So thanks um, again. Uh, it's a round table, so please prepare your questions and your interventions accordingly. But before we move to the other question, I wanted to bring TR's case study in to the discussion. So, and then we can fully open up the to, to questions and discussion. TR? Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. My name is uh, TR. I'm the lead project for Pisces 2. Uh, Pisces 2 is a continuation or uh, upscale for our Pisces 1, which was to demonstrate the feasibility of connecting one of the remote islands in Chuk Lagoon. Um, our situation is, well, we have about 40 plus inhabited islands, uh, only one of which has power, uh, water, sewage, and internet. About 15 megs via satellite out. Um, we have about 48,000, 48,600 48, population um, as of 2010. Um, so you can imagine um, the market is small and um, it's it's not a very profitable investment if if your clients don't have power and they won't be able to. Uh, you know, hook up to the to the internet, if, even if it was available on their island. So our thing is, we want to concentrate on schools, um, working on solar powered uh, remote labs. Um, our focus and goals are to uh, scale up uh, from that one school to add two additional schools. Um, focus on local capacity since this will be a new thing to most of the islands um, and we feel that's the best way for a long-term uh, sustainability and maintenance if we have somebody there that knows how to work it um, and that would be teachers and principals and school administrators we're also looking for key community uh, members that are interested in helping We only have one ISP, so um, I feel they take their time and they pick their market very wisely um, in a profit, profitable sense. Uh, but uh, we do have some blessings. Um, since we're close to the equator, we get uh, pretty decent sun hours, so solar is always uh, 
on top on the alternative power source. Um, and then we've also been playing with uh, some ubiquity, ubiquity devices, which are very low powered um, and so far proof efficient for us. We were able to shoot um, a link from the main island to an island maybe 10 miles or 16 kilometers off. Um, the highest peak was 137 megs, I believe. Um, I'd say it'd be consistent 70, 70 megs. Um, so the bottleneck out would still be the 50 megs out of the ISP. So we're looking at ways uh, we could take advantage of the faster link internally, uh, maybe looking at local content or um, internal video. Um, yeah. And uh, we've been also getting some help from the European Union, putting in some solar systems in some of the schools, not all, but some. Um, so we're also looking at those places as a uh, possible uh, future um, projects. And of course, if you're going to go go to work on one of these islands, you got to take a boat trip. So it's like a vacation before you go to work. You know, you arrive on site fresh. Um, and we have a uh, more information about the project at the Sea Alliance on that side if you want to pick it up. Thank you. Thank you very much, TR, for that, um, I guess, ex exemplification of the issues that were um, addressed uh, previously and, and the challenges that are in fact faced, even in spite of the technological um, advances that are present and available to use. Um, if we don't have basic power or water, then these things may, may be a bit of a, a, a secondary issue in some cases in the small island states. So as I said, this is a round table, so it's not a panel type environment. So please feel free to intervene, present, to, to share as you, as you see fit, not only with necessarily your questions that people have spoken, but your own interventions directly. Um, recognize um, gentlemen to my right. Um, anybody else who has questions, please just um, jump in and I'll, I will call upon you for oh, interventions. Um, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Yen from Microsoft. Uh, just a new, new question, just want to follow up on the TV white space uh, topic this gentleman brought up and just want to inform everyone that there is a upcoming um, conference in Bangkok on November the 18th, uh, a global summit on dynamic spectrum access which is focused on TV white space and its usage in rural connectivity is one of the big, you know, sort of focus, you know, connecting the remaining four villains. So I really encourage, um, people, um, you know, ladies and gentlemen in, in this room to, to consider attending the event if you are interested. And also there are a lot of ongoing um, commercial pilots around the world in, in Africa, but here in Asia as well, including both developing market and developed markets like Singapore. Um, also, you know, island, you know, the archipelago countries like Philippines, and, and we are hoping here in Indonesia we'll be able to start a, a trial soon. So that's something really um, fit for, you know, as you mentioned, large body water. Uh, in, in Singapore, for example, even though it's a small country, but, you know, and the connectivity is really good there, but there are still pockets of the islands, you know, including the harbor where the um, uh, the business opportunity is that there are literally tens and thousands of ships, container ships, parked on the harbor. It's like a small city floating on, on the water. And the service provider there want to reach that customer, which currently rely on satellite. You know, it's, it's very expensive, it's, it's very limited. But if they were to use TV white space at a lower frequency, they would be able to reach the, the, the container ships, which typically park between 5 to 10 kilometers out and just beam the signal from the shore. So that same technology can actually be very effectively used in islands, you know, around the world uh, for, for, you know, 
island countries and, and for any country that was a, this kind of challenge, terrain challenges. So I'd really um, invite everyone to attend the conference or um, get in touch uh, with, with, with myself if you're interested. Thank you. Ah, yes. Well, I just wanted to share some of uh, my experiences uh, working in Haiti as a small island nation and the challenge that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm Bruce Bakey from uh, Invinio. Um, and we went there to first do earthquake relief and get networks up and running to connect the aid workers uh, in Port-au-Prince. Um, but after those networks were up and established and the aid work started happening, um, it became quite apparent that in the rural parts of Haiti where there was more work to be done in aid relief, there were no networks available. And the challenge that we had there was uh, in Port-au-Prince itself, there were five ISPs, but they didn't leave the main capital city. They didn't view that there was enough business in the rural areas to justify building those networks out. And uh, the challenge we had was convincing them uh, to bring those rural, uh, the backbone into those rural areas and the approach that we ended up taking was building a shared network that all the ISPs could cooperate on and then sell the last mile connection in those rural areas. So we did a test area and within the first month we had signed $100,000 worth of connectivity contracts and the ISPs woke up, wow, there is business in the rural areas. And to date now, we've extended that network over 20% of rural Haiti, and there's been over a million dollars in connectivity contracts those ISPs have signed in those rural areas. And so the real lesson learned there is that um, while the, the ISPs don't see uh, business in those rural areas, uh, using a shared network approach, lowering the infrastructure costs, and using um, low-cost Wi-Fi point-to-point connections uh, and building out that network that you can build an affordable backbone to those rural areas and there's enough business to keep the ISPs happy and wanting to do business in those locations. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, very good intervention there um, regarding Haiti. Um, is there anything else um, before I call upon some colleagues in the room to speak? Anything else uh, pressing? Um, what I wanted to do actually was, if no one else has anything burning at the moment, I noticed I have colleagues from New Zealand and Australia in the room. And I'm wondering if um, this discussion would, would somehow appeal to what's going on in their countries as big small islands or medium-sized small islands, as we said earlier, and if there are any parallels that we could probably see or learn from um, given what you've heard so far. Um, anyone wanting to, to jump in and say anything? I'm not going to call names, but you know who you are. Cheryl Langdon from Australia, it kind of narrows it down a little bit when you're sitting opposite at the, opposite me and you identified me from a somewhat larger island, albeit not necessarily developing. Um, but the tyranny of distance, of course, that, that we have with large land mass and low population has a number of parallels and uh, the shared network approach um, could, I suppose, be um, a parallel to what uh, current and past government are deciding about a national broadband network. So it's last mile um, to be able to get out to uh, rural and remote. Um, hybrid networks in our country um, are pretty much essential because we, we do need to have a combination of um, wireless and indeed satellite access. Um, but again, it's uh, not unusual to have the cry of um, affordability and uh, we have, uh, like many of the developing nations, an, an unreasonable impost on the end user. Um, it becomes uh, those that have can and, and the majority of us who have not can't. Um, but we've got a very high uptake of mobile um, access. Uh, I live in a semi-rural area. Um, so back in my dim dark past when I wanted to be ensured that I had to have connectivity for my small and micro business, it was line microwave. I actually had to buy into that. So it's, it, it, there are parity and similarities. 
Um, but what I think we need to recognise is the opportunity for sharing. I get excited about hearing, you know, putting a couple of regional proposals together. Um, we need to start talking perhaps um, as um, loose consortia uh, to with some of the bigger kids in camp um, who may be able to assist us with the infrastructure and design. Um, but there's there's a an approach that I heard. Uh, I think it was you, Patrick, talking about the um, uh, the fear of of losing yeah. a job over no. You, Maureen, um, it, you're losing a job because you're going to put an e economy in somewhere. Um, perhaps we should play the um, uh, the knowledge management and uh, preservation of culture card, um, because a, a digitised world can, in fact, be a very good one for historical record maintenance of um, languages being lost our own Indigenous communities in Australia are making very good use and I'd like to think if we have this, and I hope we do have this as a theme at a future IGF, um, that we could encourage perhaps uh, some of the uh, Australian Aboriginal Native Networks to be talking as well because we now have languages that are being spoken and taught that literally didn't exist earlier on, so they're, they're being reborn um, languages and cultures. So I think maybe we can try and play the culture card over the I'm going to lose my job. Thank you. I think that's an excellent um, proposition, um, Cheryl, and I'm wondering if there's anybody else who is interested in taking up that challenge of, of moving forward from here into working together to, to develop some solutions to the challenges that we are facing. and. I'm not leaving the discussion in this room um, for another IGF next year, but maybe to take it from here and start working together within our um, geographic regions or hopefully as small islands as a group. Um, maybe my colleague from Trinidad Bevel, you have any thoughts on, on working regionally together on, on these sorts of issues? I'm always willing. Good morning. This is Bevel Wooding, uh, working in the Caribbean region. Um, based in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I, I do have a question that I wanted to, to just find out if there was any example of the TV white space being used um, to connect um, in any of the small island states. Is there any active project where, um, where it has been successfully used to connect rural communities? That's something I'd be very, very interested in. Uh, I believe there are a number of trials around the world, not many in small island nations, but I think there are in Singapore and the Philippines, as far as I know. Um, I think the gentleman from Microsoft probably knows more about them than I do. Uh, if I may just add to that, um, in, in Philippines, for example, in, in a small island called Boho, which unfortunately recently had a, had a large earthquake, so the project likely to be delayed a little bit, but. Um, that's where one of the uh, projects that's actually had by the ICT office of the Filipino government. And the idea is the, the, the genesis of the project was actually for fishery enforcement, that they have difficulty enforcing the fishery rules uh, with registration because they don't have connectivity, the, all the things were done manually. So um, that was part of the motivation, but then once we have the network in place, it will serve the schools around that area and also the local government um, entities. Uh, and another example, um, which is not an island, but but rather, um, you know, remote, like an island, you know, in, in, in rural Kenya, where uh, it's a small village, um, where we have deployed uh, together with our partners um, a, a solar-powered um, base station, um, where the, the island, uh, not island. The village literally didn't have any road, it didn't have any uh, you know, electricity infrastructure to begin with, but we were able to deliver internet into that village with solar power, with TV white space. Um, in fact, I was just now just wondering, does everybody know what TV white space is? I mean, I'm just, I don't want to <laughs> assume well, that. Uh, given that you uh, Mac I know Microsoft is one of the um, pioneers of, of rolling that out in Africa and um, Asia, so perhaps, yeah. A quick um, primer. Oh, okay. I try to be doing two things. But if everybody's familiar with Wi-Fi, and we almost, I can say, no, people cannot live without Wi-Fi. Um, um, TV white space you could think of as deploying a Wi-Fi-like technology in the TV band. That's why it's called TV white space. So the white space is referring to 
the unused TV channels. So likely on the island states, um, the TV broadcasting are not actually occupying all the UHF channels. So there are plenty of low frequency um, bands that's a very, very you know, suitable for long distance, long range communication. Um, and when you deploy the technology in that ra in the range, uh, in the band, the benefit is long range. It doesn't require line of sight. So with, you know, when you have huge trees or large body waters uh, or, or just mountains, that is actually very suitable. Um, so in fact, it has been the, the wireless communication the industry's dream to be able to actually do broadband in that in that band, but traditionally it's been occupied by TV broadcast, and therefore it's out of the question. But now with digital transition, a lot of those bands are actually being freed up. And even before the transition, there's just literally a lot of channels laying fallow that are not being used. So those are really, I mean, from a government policy perspective, you can lobby the government saying, well, those are the what you know in the spectrum world it, that's that's the ocean that's the beachfront property what we call it's the best spectrum uh, range and if you can open it up for wi-fi like access and that's often time you hear the term super wi-fi uh, referring to that long range characteristics all right thank you um i know we have just a couple minutes left and i'm recognizing that the other workshop participants are probably arriving to, to, to work together in the room. And maybe a last comment from our lead discussants, Maureen, Patrick, and TR, on the session today and what we can do f f uh, moving forward. Um, just very briefly, um, there have been some really interesting um, uh, interventions about um, collaboration, and um, I think that that's really important. It's something we need. we will definitely be working on. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to collaborating with, with other people like TR, for instance, and on some of these low-cost solutions, and uh, in, in particular the white space um, scenario. And, and you know, I would like to discuss with you any issues you have with the government in, in just using those uh, uh, allocations. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, guys. It's very comforting that. Uh, we're not the only ones trying to figure this out. Um, uh, a lot of information. Thank you. All right. So, in the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up. Um, is there anything else from the floor? So, I'm seeing three hands. So, four. So, let's go quickly. Go. I actually have a remote message from Carlton Samuels in Jamaica who was trying to follow and couldn't. It's longish though. Do you want me to read it? Proceed. Go ahead. He says, remind the audience that commercial broadband rollout will be demand driven and so far in most of our territories, that's the Caribbean, there is no demand. Direct them to Ectel pronouncements solution here is to drive local content development using a variety of initiatives. E-government and public apps will be very helpful here. And governments must lead. Capacity building in mobile apps development for useful public purposes is one initiative. The regulatory framework should replace POTS as universal service obligation he was asking about that, with broadband as they have in the Bahamas. This way, wired broadband, such as cable, gets a shot in the arm. Tell them to look to changing the wireless spectrum allocation to allow for niche broadband networks with cross-connect assured as long as the technical standards are adhered to. That's Carlton from me. I'm an end user. My name is Deirdre Williams. I come from St. Lucia, which is one of the small Caribbean islands. I was very happy to hear people putting electricity and connection in the same breath. Two years ago, we had a hurricane, and we were the most popular house on the road because we had a small generator, and it had everybody's cell phone plugged into it. Thank you. So I saw four hands out there. Is that only one or? Yes, finished. Are we done? 
Hi, Shiva Mohammed Isa, follow from Trinidad and Tobago. I know we're wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to not lose that concrete thing that Tracy said earlier about that we're having this discussion today, but let's keep it going and kind of continue the collaboration. So I'll be at the ISOC booth outside, which is right opposite this room, and we're generating a mailing list from this. So if you can come and just give your contacts so that when we do have things in our regions, we can keep sharing. I know the Pacific chapter and the Trinidad chapter has been doing a lot of collaboration in terms of ISOC, so we can get some other stakeholders from the region and we really keep this collaboration so it's more than just multi-stakeholder talk and it becomes something concrete that'll be great so right at the ISOC booth outside cool thanks thank you there was a last comment What's cool that? thanks thank you there was a last comment What's cool that? thanks thank you so with that <laughs> uh, I would like to call the, the, the round table to, to close thank you all for your participation it was excellent, and um, let's do more of this, and let's work together going forward. Thank you very much.